Unless you want to leave that this part of it. Yeah. I could. I could well, the, the gift shop's not open, and that's where I usually sign in at SWAT. Oh yeah, you can go in and sign and go through the front desk. Oh, Holly, I'll sign in. Okay. Holly's the vending machine is operational. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Cindy, welcome to your training. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of our rendezvous event before? Uh, not really. It's an annual event, except for last year, that we do for fourth graders in the district as a culminating celebration to their year of state history curriculum. So we have partnered with PSD for this event since 2002, but it was already old when they came to us. It's, it's in its 30s. Maybe I shouldn't say old. <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> this event is really about having fun and allowing the students to access objects, specimens, activities that they haven't been able to do in their classrooms for whatever reason. And I always like to emphasize to the educators, facilitators, we are not the primary source of information. They've been doing this all year with their teacher. Um, so this is not the first time they're hearing this content. Um, we're here to enhance and add on to what they've been doing. Hopefully, whatever we're saying sounds familiar to them, at the very least. Um, the rendezvous is organized in five stations, and each station has its theme, and I'll go over those in a minute. The students come in a very um, organized rotation. They go to every station. It's not a free-for-all, fair kind of environment. Um, Classes are grouped together so that we have up to 85 students in a group, plus their chaperones and teachers, and what's called a host, a rendezvous host that comes from the district that will lead the group through the stations. There's a specific order as to which stations they go to um, when they arrive, and they follow that order through the building. Um, up to 85, so there are anywhere from 370 to just over 400 kids on each day of the four days of the event. I think 27 schools total are coming, 26. It's a pretty good chunk of elementaries in the district. Um, rotations are about 30 minutes long each with a few minutes passing period. So the first station starts at 9.30 and we're done by 12.30. So we're asking volunteers and staff to be here at 8.30 to set up stations, go over the expectations for the day, specifics. Um, but you can also have breakfast, PSD cater, provides breakfast, you can get your coffee, prepare yourself for the <laughs> onslaught. <laughs> and then um, break down the station at the end of the day, bring everything back to the classroom, and there'll be lunch. We're fed well for mm -hmm. this event. A lot of people have been asking about wearing costumes. You're welcome to dress thematically. Um, it's important for us to be historically accurate, but it's more important for us to honor our um, American Indian partners. We have an advisory council, and out of deference to them, we do not dress as Indians. So, no little Indian feather dresses <laughs> or, um, yes, I'll say <laughs> <laughs> but a long skirt's okay? Yes. Um, look like a miner in denim jeans and a flannel shirt. One volunteer's going to wear a t-shirt. She has bison on it. Those kinds of things are fun. Kind of thematic. Um, prairie dress, an apron, a bonnet. That's fun. Um, we're expecting parking to be kind of tight. Staff is going to be requested to park elsewhere. We're using the east side of the building and the turnaround in the northeast corner for bus parking. I think there could be as many as 13 buses here at any one time. We'll have PSD volunteers and potentially chaperones that come not on the bus but in their own cars and we're still open for general visitation on those days. So. Just want to give you a heads up. You'll be one of the first people here coming at 8.30. You'll probably be okay, but just be forewarned. 
structure just to the south. So because rendezvous is so old, it's gone through a couple of different iterations over the years, and um, the last iteration has been done for 10 years, and so I think there are probably some teachers who are, um, have a lot of affection for the way it was done. But we took the opportunity when we moved into this building to address the fact that the state has passed new curriculum standards. Um, and the fact that we are now a merged science and history institution, which the curriculum coordinators are really excited about, the fact we could address science and history together at this point. So there's there's changes this year. The themes are new. Um, we have taken what we think were the favorite activities from the old rendezvous and converted them into checkout trunks. But I anticipate that you may hear teachers saying things like, oh, well, we really miss the gold mining. That is a checkout trunk. They can still do that in their classroom. It's not gone. Um, so we want to make sure that they know that. Um, and additionally, remind people that rendezvous is for the students, not the teachers. <laughs> so the teachers may miss something, but the kids will never know. This is their one and only rendezvous. Also, historically, we relied a lot on guest presenters, and we had a lot of problems with that. Um, we don't have authority over the content that guest presenters might be sharing with the students. Guest presenters might be available for some sessions, but not all. And so there was a real inconsistency to experience for any one year's group of fourth graders. Some might see the really cool group of folklore go dancers do the next thing happens, and others would not. And that was problematic. Um, teachers didn't like that. Um, and we found too, we, we had theme areas before, and we might have eight presenters for the farming and ranching theme area, and one presenter for the fur trade doing the living history. Um, and so some kids who we really wanted everybody to experience fur trade because we only had one station, not everybody did. So we decided to go more with in-house generated presentations, training volunteers um, and staff to facilitate, to create that consistency across the experience for people. Um, but change is hard, and I expect that some teachers are gonna really feel nostalgia for what was. In fact, even the last group of volunteers expressed some nostalgia about things, and I was like, <laughs> change it. Um, anyway, if you hear things from the teachers, just be sure to let them know. They should know, but in case they don't, there are trunks available. Is there a list of the trunks? They are right here, <clears throat> in the very last paragraph. So we used to do a Native American station, mining with gold panning, railroad, soldiers and settlers, and the fur trade. Good timing. <laughs> okay. So, today's session, we're going to talk about the fur trade and the biodiversity wall station. So, in this up, um, station, the students will actually get to come into the galleries and see the biodiversity wall, see the exhibit um, that we call the contact wall, where the Native American story blends with the um, early trapper trader prospector's story and the contact in the middle. Uh, we're doing three mini stations here. So the students um, have the opportunity to visit three locations. Um, I, we've talked about putting two of them outside on the ed deck and then having them come into the biodiversity world, depending on whether we might have to move the outdoor stuff in. Um, so we'll need a facilitator station in each one of those mini stations. The biodiversity wall, a tracks and scat, pelt and furs table, and a tools of the trade mountain man table. So this packet I've put together for you has background information on the animals that we specifically want to highlight um, and identifies those three mini stations. And then each mini station has some background information um, for you to feel more knowledgeable about, about what you're doing, um, has some inquiry questions related to the biodiversity wall specifically because there's no touching there. The other two stations have touching, so I anticipate the kids will just be coming up with lots of questions on their own. Um, 
So we look at several different layers of fur trade. First, you've got that primary layer that is the fur trade rendezvous era, which is 1825 to 1840, and it's based on the beaver and the fact that beaver fur was used to create a felt that made this style of men's hat. So this was ubiquitous. Every man had this on the East Coast. Um, the fur trade was very intense. Beaver in Europe were extirpated. Um, they just hunted the beaver till they were gone there, and then they hit North America, and they started east and moved their way west, and it's um, an act of grace, I guess, that the style changed from beaver felt to silk in 1840, and the prices bottomed out for beaver felt. Um, otherwise, the beaver would be extinct. They were on that path, so um, they're extirpated in, in East Coast states by 18, oh, mid 1830s, so um, they just hunted them all. It's pretty incredible. Um, so, in your packet, you will have under Tools of the Mountain Men a list of prices. And so, for the beaver, you can see in 1826 it's $3, it peaks at $3.50. And then when the bottom starts dropping out, 1840, price drops down to $2. And the next layer for the fur trade has to do with the bison. And this is not the same group of men. The men that were out trapping the beaver are what we call mountain men, and they really were solitary guys living winters in the mountains on the riparian zones, <coughs> trapping the beaver. And then in the summer, they'd come down and rendezvous up with the representatives from the fur companies out east they would exchange their pelts for the items they needed to survive the next winter, the upcoming winter. Why did they trap in the winter? Because the felt, the, the fur is thickest thin. That's when they have them, yeah. Yeah. You don't want a scraggly <laughs> summer beaver. They're all, <laughs> all furs <laughs> falling out. Yeah, but they don't put it on the hat. It's not, the hats aren't furry, Well, they have so. to have a looking bit. No, it's not <laughs> <of> you. <laughs> That's a factor of age. <laughs> no, but they... Do they use that fur then? It just they said to make a felt. If they make a felt, yeah. So they, I don't understand the exact so process, but you know it's a skin, rubbing. It? Yeah, they needed the fur, but it's a rubbing of the fur together so that the scar it, hairs go yeah, together. Yeah, so the there. thicker it is, the better felt that we end up with. Okay. Sorry, that's just one little part of the information. <laughs> that Excellent I question. <laughs> I'm not sure if I have that. I'll add that in. The shelving? The winter trapping. The winter trapping. Oh, yeah. Well, you do. They, you say they do. Oh, it says they, they did trap winter. You but said when, when the fur was the thickest. When the fur was the thickest. It's better than I thought. Okay. Um, so the next main spike, if you will, in fur trade has to do with bison. This is a different group of men. The mountain men as a breed kind of died out post-1840. Um, and there was some bison hunting in the 1850s. It started picking up in the 1860s, and the peak was really 1870s. That's when the bulk of the impact for the herds was felt. And uh, the reason for that is the, the expansion of the railroad across the continent. So bison, we know, are hunted by American Indians for basically all their parts. They harvested organs, meat, um, muscle tendons, sinew, the furs, the bones. They had uses for a great many of the parts. Americans hunted the bison um, limitedly to provide meat to, say, mining boom towns after the gold rush in 1859. They were providing meat up to those guys where they were working. Um, but with the expansion of the railroad in the 1870s, two things happened primarily. The bison herds were huge. There were 100 million bison here in 1800, potentially. Um, maybe as few as 60, but huge herds across the continent. 
So you'd have these herds crossing railroad tracks and they could actually take two days to cross the track and so your train is now very much off schedule. So the railroad companies hired men to um, hunt the bison, to provide meat to the workers laying the tracks, but also just to clear them off the tracks to not delay the trains. They also began offering hunting excursions. So they'd build these special observation cars where um, people could ride out onto the plains, shoot all the bison in sight, and then head home. They wouldn't even harvest the bison. It was just, I killed 100 in 30 minutes or whatever the, you know, the records were. And that's, that was the sport of it, just to see how many they could kill in the shortest amount of time. Because when you've got 60 million animals mm -hmm. on a continent, there was definitely the attitude that that's an endless supply. Plus, there's the very subversive idea of um, you're going to win a war if you take away the enemy's commissary. And that definitely um, was happening. There are documents from a couple of different generals, including General, um, General Sherman, who says exactly that. You want to get the enemy, you take away his food supply. And so the government would give ammunition away to people who said they were going out to hunt bison. So what happens, um, you've got a big interest in having bison fur for coats. So these guys would go out, hunt the bison, skin them. At a certain point, they didn't even care what time of year it was. They were just skinning the animals. So they would um, attach chains to the animals' hides and use horses or wagons to just kind of rip the hides free and throw the hides in the back of the wagon and then pile these things up. I mean, there's pictures of just you know, 20 foot high piles of bison hides that would then be shipped back to the East Coast um, to be converted into these coats and blankets. And they weren't using the meat, they, weren't, they were just leaving the, the bodies to rot. Later, when um, more people were taking advantage of the Homestead Act, they would go out and stake their 160 acre claim. And one of the ways they would make ends meet in the first year before they had their first crop was just go out and collect all the bleached bison bones off their property and sell that because it was used to make fertilizer. There were that many bones available to them that they could survive a year until their crop came in. I mean, it's just a pot. Oh, God. Yeah. So the next layer of hunting that we have has to do with the wolvers. So as you get more and more farmers and ranchers out on the prairie, they begin hiring hunters to trap and kill specifically wolves and coyotes because they were known to predate on their calves and lambs. And so um, there's a, a bounty for those furs. And it varied from state to state how much these um, wolvers would get for their coyote and wolf pelts. Wolf, wolves were valued more highly than coyote, but um, you would bring your coyote or wolf fur into a special county office and they would clip the ear off to make sure that that pelt didn't somehow end up back out on the market and brought back in for a second bounty. Um, and I don't know what happened to those furs. There wasn't a value in the fur itself. There was value in the animal being dead. Um, so probably one of those things just got pissed out the back window. Um, but that's why we address coyote and wolves here. Now, because of the unique situation wolves are in as um, a yearly extinct species, it is just about impossible to get a wolf pelt for educational purposes. So we don't have one. Mounted specimen, we don't have a pelt. Um, they're not here in the state now, so they're not on our biodiversity wall, but it is important to address them as an animal that's native to this state that's extirpated now. I had heard that they had just crossed over within the last couple of months. Yep, it's mm -hmm. true. So they're not that they're living here permanently. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of what I heard yeah, from I'm Kim, it came in and, and headed back out. Isn't but, it more than one wolf too, like single males coming in and not that? Yeah, it is. Kim knows more than I do. Yeah. She <laughs> can trust the cattle from it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I'll see how they do. See what happens. 
Um, and then lastly, as you know, the kind of stereotypical view of a mountain man, you got your Kit Carson and Daniel Boone hat, the raccoon. So we don't have a coon skin cap, but we do have a raccoon pelt that we can have out. Um, fox were hunted too, again, because they predated, but there were bounties on them, like there were the wolves of what kind of things. So we can kind of go over the biodiversity wall. Um, so we want to make sure the students have a chance to see the size of the animals and match the animals up with their ecosystem. So we've got the beaver mounted on the wall by the riparian zone, the bison in the short grass prairie enclosure, we have a coyote associated with, I think he's kind of on the margin between short grass prairie and foothills, but we don't have any coyote there. Um, we don't have a deer, but we do have deer antlers on the wall, and we do have a <coughs> raccoon, and we've got our bear. Around the corner from the biodiversity wall on the contact wall there is a bison, fur coat, and bear skin gloves. So you can plant a seed with the kids to see if they can go find some of those things. And I've provided a handful of just inquiry questions to help have a conversation with the students as they come to the station. So again, we want to make the connection between the animal and where they live. So where did the fur traders go to find the animals? Well, they used waterways like highways and so we follow the waterways up into the foothills and um, they knew they would find beaver there but they're also using other clues like scat and track and that's where the other mini station comes into play so if the conversation you're having with the kids winds around to the clues you can send them on to check out poop mm -hmm. yeah. um, Okay, so the next page is the pelts and fur, scat and tracks mini station. We have the pelts, and we also have this box of got some, a couple of horns, a horn and paper, but then we have the tracks. So the only animal that we do not have replica scat for is bison. They don't make it. I guess it's too big to go out and make a mold. So I took my mom up to the Terry Bison Ranch and we picked up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so this is, is not rubber. No, <laughs> yes. but it is touchable. I mean, people used to pick this stuff up off the prairie and uh, fuel. They used it as fuel, so oh, they'd also yes. contest. Yes. Kids you are reading my mind. Well, yeah, like bison chip so. chucking contest. <laughs> well, the kids when they took the wagons out, the kids would walk <laughs> along the side and, and throw the cow pies, cow pies into the cook pot. Or the, and the stew pot. And the stew pot just adds a little extra yeah. tang to it. That's your job, kid. Get out there and yeah. Or there's yeah. no dinner tonight. And there's no food. Yeah. And there's there's no heat. Right. Yeah. So for the animals that bison. we're talking about, the beaver, the bison, the raccoon, the coyote, the bear, we have tracks. Scat. We have scat for the bears. Pretty oh, impressive. Wow. So, that's not like bear. Oh, is he bigger or smaller? Well, no, they have like they eat a lot of berries, so it's rounder. Well, mm -hmm. maybe it's just not the right color. Yeah, I mean it is just rubber. Oh, so. it is. Rubber. Yeah. Well, I guess you can right, kind of see. You can kind of see the break. <laughs> you can see the breakdown. <laughs> yeah. They don't chew real well though, because we had a bear eating apples, and it just big chunks. The but cores would come out the other end. Well, <laughs> they probably don't have a lot of chunks grinding of teeth. They have more ribbons. They just gulp it down. Yeah. 
Yeah, and just kind of rip it up. And if they're like dogs, they need again. And coprophages, isn't that the word? Uh, that's, um, that's a good one. I think that's the word for regurgitating. Oh, dear. Yeah. So for the fur, you can point out that there's three layers of fur. Um, the under fur, which is that really soft base layer, and then the outer longer hairs, which there are fewer of, are the gar hairs. Ooh. And then some have a really, really fine fur called on hair, A W N, Ooh. which between the other two. Yeah. Which, you know, so here's you know that really fine under like fur. Down. Yeah, it's really soft and then it's wiry. Kind of wiry pellet. Yeah, so beaver fur is water repellent because they had the glands under their tail that produce castoreum and they just comb that through their fur. That really makes it waterproof. And I guess their back claw, one of their back toes has a claw that's like a two part. So they actually can use it. Oh, yeah. Picking out things, dragging stones. <laughs> you at least be overfitted. Um, <laughs> there's something <laughs> to, 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 No, they're here for the kids to touch. Okay. I want them to so they can do this. Ah, yeah. 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 They That's can't cool. take a razor blade to it. I prefer that. No. Not happen. So you can do that with cool. all the critters, find those awesome. different layers of fur. And yeah, you can. Determine anatomy, you can see eyelids, noses. I think our. Something has ears. What's ears. Oh, that? Is that beer has ears that close? Yeah, well, like, I, I like, remember and then when they were out the one, one time when I was here that it was actually ears. So you can see. But look at how tiny. Yeah, so here's our. Well, but it's kind of magnified. Oh, and the eyes. So you can compare the real thing with this. Yeah, he's kind of a gruesome one because he's got his face. I was going to ask if you want to When we do it for public, we tend to fold the head under so really little kids don't see it. I think fourth graders it's more yeah. the four-year-olds that are like, look at his face. <laughs> it looks like my dog. Last week, and I think he was in a daze because he walked right in front of the car and stopped. And he looked around like he was looking for something, and then he looked at us, and then he just stood there. It was like he wasn't, I don't know. He acted like he wasn't there. I've never seen a coyote, so maybe because he was in the park. They're so used to seeing people. Even something or whatever. He acted like he was drugged or something. I don't know. It was Yeah. <laughs> 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 
art project through the teacher. Have fun, post. <laughs> <laughs> all right, scat. You guys know all about scat. Yeah, so I, I do. actually have a scat. I got a little well, plastic with all the. I thought you meant a ring with like well, rattles. No, it's, 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 it's <laughs> all the, it's all the animal like a tracks, key ring, key ring with <laughs> yes. all the yes. pictures. We have the like shows around right here okay. somewhere. It'll be out of time. Okay, okay. I got a week to post together. Okay. But we do have the conversation about how you can identify an animal's diet based on Yeah, it's very important. Yes. It's also Checking it out. What one did he eat this morning? The color, oh, that's good. Being very, yeah, great, yeah, first. Mm -hmm. How fresh is it? about tracks and of course the scat and the tracks are the clues that the mountain men are using to find mm -hmm. the beaver, non trees of course, the lodges and dams with the other big clues. <laughs> but then the wolvers who are looking for the coyote and the older than me also for scat and tracks as well. Um, so there's a little bit of information about the tracks and there's a lot about how um, you can see the claws when they're walking versus the cats that are walking with their claws are attractive. So if you know, bobcat, you're not going to see those marks. And we're not addressing those in this event, but if it comes up, please, by all means, talk to me about it. There, one, like going through the snow, they're attractive. Because then mm -hmm. we saw a bunch of traps when they were walking. We're trying to figure out what, what, what it was. And, well, obviously some of them creep you down, it's like elk or deer, because you know, the tracks are so far apart. But, yeah, the retraction part is, yeah, the key things. Okay, and then the last mini station is what we call the tools of the trays. So the kinds of things a mountain man would want to have with them. Does this go on? Yeah. I'll go on this one to edit. I got a whole box of this over at Carnegie's. You don't have a mink? No. Because wouldn't that have been important at one time or not? Actually, I saw a mink in the Poudre River right last spring. People have been seeing them. might have a better sense for that. We'll do Mustela Day in May and we get pelts from the Division of Wildlife for all the species in the state. In my readings, um, I think I'm writing a lot about the 19th century fur trade with them. They have just been too, not as common. So I'm wondering, yeah, well, there's kind of more They were trapped down. Like, we have, we get even more for this one. Women like the coats in the 30s and 40s. Stores, oh, so it's a different time period. Maybe it was a good idea. Some of the items that will be on the table are not here today, and that is because the kit is checked out to a school. Yeah, they'll be back for the event. So we'll have um, what are called tray blankets. So it's like a navy wool with a stripe of red. It's called salvage. And there's kind of that army green wool they get. But a lot of the mountain men wear clothes like that. And then the buffalo skimmers tend to just be standard, kind of those canvasy wool pants with the flat front foot and pants.
suspenders. Mm -hmm. um, so we will have compass and some bear grease. I'm not even sure how to <laughs> open it. <laughs> Bear grease and somebody's been in it, like there's fingerprints. I'm like, yeah, who would want to? <laughs> real thing, real thing. Do you smell? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just like wax. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't like the real bear grease from that really nasty and they put it on people's feet the other way? Yeah, yeah. I think so. And then they would put it on like their ankles instead of socks because they didn't have waterproofing. Well, it was like lard. Yeah. You know, and it would make it waterproof and warm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. So the things that we have that are checked out right now, we do have a beaver trap, so that will be back next week. Um, it's a green river knife, which is a style of knife for skimming. That was very popular with the mountain, and we'll have that back there. We've got a couple skillets. Is that going to be in something? Yes. How does it's, that work? <laughs> well, it's in a blue board box like this that has, um, gosh, it's been two years ago since we built it. I think it's got like a mylar window. We can open the box, but yeah, it's a no touching mm, yeah. object. Same with the yeah. beaver trap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. the pins so out, it's there, just yeah. not even risk it. The trade cloth and blankets will be back. The trade beads. So they, um, the French introduced glass beads here in North America. And they became very popular with the American Indian women. They had traditionally used shells and bone beads and um, seed beads. But when they had a chance to adopt the glass beads, they really took to it and they came. Well, you guys have seen oh, pretty yeah. amazing. It's just incredible. It's just amazing. Yeah. So these guys would often carry glass beads with them so they could trade with the American Indians that came across with things they might just want to need. Um, that's true also for the the frou-frou. Um, Word? It's a real word. Okay. So frou frou could be a set of ribbons of different color, different length. And I've got a set, it's just out in the box. But again, these guys would carry the frou frou with them because they could, again, trade that for things they needed. So it was a currency back then. And what about red paint? Yes, so vermilion. Um, it's also popular in red ochre because it's a natural mm -hmm. pigment that has waterproofing um, properties, so they would carry that. That's listed, see, millions in here somewhere. Oh, it's a trade item that they can buy. Buttons, ribbons, beads. Oh, there's a lot of things. Yeah, so I've collected from a Tomahawk. bunch I of different primary sources, you know, different parts of the country, different years, I'm sure, impacted this stuff. But mm -hmm. um, if you look at the cost of items, oh, yeah. yeah, I did not do a good job editing stuff together. Cost of items, cost of items. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. It was so that's one, that's one source. And then a different source had items that you trade for a horse, another was items that you trade for a buffalo robe, and there was a different oh. list of the kinds of things American Indians were interested in trading for. But all of these would represent different parts of the country in different years, but it's not always easy to find that in the primary sources. Like, what year are they collecting this information for? Some of these books that I was reading date to like 1940s. So. Oh. Well, because for them it was only 100 years ago That's instead right. of 150 years ago. That's so there's right. a value in what they were doing, but they weren't as thorough about, well, we're talking about the year of, and we're talking about the region the time of. time period. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the Indians are pretty much wiped out by the 1890s.
So would, it seems like a lot of this would be stuff that would be like issued to a mountain man once he signed on with a company. But a lot of them were free agents. They, they do well. their rendezvous in the summer and probably go to a trading post mm -hmm. and party. So they did both. There were trading posts here. We had Ben's Fort down south. Um, there were four, this is hard to say, the four fur forts along <laughs> the Platte River. Here. You guys can laugh. You did it very well. Um, so <laughs> Fort Vasquez and um, Fort St. Brain. Oh, yeah. What, what about Cheyenne or Laramie? I know yep, so Cheyenne was Fort Laramie, Laramie outside of Cheyenne. Yep. Yeah. There were two other smaller forts right right around here. Uh, Fort Vasquez. No, no. Right around here. Right along the Platte, a little south and east here. Fort Jackson and keep going now. <laughs> They're all abandoned, gone. They restored one as a Colorado State Historic Property. Yeah, that's the Adobe one. Yeah, yeah, you saw that last one. Is that the one south? That one's south. Oh, south. Yeah, it's closer to the Platte, though. It's a great, great little place to go. Well, right, well yeah, we got. Yeah. They got trading posts here, definitely, and then the rendezvous. Um, it's a misnomer for us to, in Colorado State, be having a rendezvous as a celebration of state history because we never had a rendezvous in the state of Colorado. <laughs> they were all in Wyoming. Oh, yeah. That's okay. We won't say anything. Yeah. We were almost there. <laughs> we were very close. We are very close. close. That's right. We were very close. Yeah. And we definitely had a large contingent of French Canadian trappers in this state. They, oh, and they founded several communities. Yes, so we're okay. 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 We just won't They just partied the somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. What I hope with this station is the kids start thinking about what needs the mountain men had the things they had to offer to trade for them because money just wasn't a value necessarily out here. It's survival. It's the, that's right, it's the currency of survival. Um, and that there's a spirit of camaraderie and cooperation out here in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, you know, our issues with the Indian Wars don't really kick in until the 1860s, so the relationships were cordial if not as you know, well, a lot of them married Indian and yeah. lived in their village. Yeah. Well, I tend not to interpret this for fourth graders. Um, <laughs> they had cold. <laughs> you know, the, the the use of you know, your your women become a commodity in that sense that um, they are forging relationships um, with other cultural groups right, they bond by bartering and brokering marriages. Um, you don't see Anglo women out here getting married to the native men, but the Anglo men would marry the native women. It was a way to create ties. It was a way to access information and resources so the Plains Indians had lived here for lots of generations and they knew the ins and outs of the land and the animals and um, when you marry into the band, you marry into the knowledge. Um, so there's some pretty cynical feminist writings about what was happening at that time frame. Um, you see the same thing in Oklahoma with the uh, the Cherokees relocated there, and there was a lot of marriages between what were called wildcatters, and the, the guys who were looking for oil. Oh, yeah. 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 So they didn't oh, it's getting more information. It's local. Get our, our <laughs> <laughs> Brenda Martin is an uh, anthropologist who's worked with the museum. Nagpra and repatriation items.
as we get her started on this subject, mm -hmm. we better be prepared to be there for a while. Mm -hmm. So I don't even go down So we won't road. go there. We won't, no. we'll just it's, do the training. training. It's such a, it's a loaded it's, concept. It's, it's, it's just stay away from that. Being a mountain man is a lonely life. Yes. And it is. If they would get sick or something, they would have to find someone, someone to take who care can help take care of them. And that's yes. close enough to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I didn't have a whole lot of options for medicine or anything. But there's a back Even someone keeping them warm and, and making them <laughs> soup. You know, that, that would be something. But, uh, so, Things that are in this box, so, okay, so there's... So we'll have the compass and the bear grease out. Some of this stuff is related, it's actually related to Lewis and Clark, and so the timing of stuff doesn't really work for Lewis and Clark. But yes. I like to keep the kit together. Yeah, it's nice. But they would yeah. have like a Tinder box or mm -hmm. a Tinder tin or something. I'm trying to remember which of those things are... Tinder tin. Tin. What would that well, be for drinking? Like, no, no, to start a fire. Oh, fire. Like a flint and steel or... Then no we, rubbing rocks together? When you did the teepee class a couple summers ago, didn't you have those things? Flint and steel? You never got a flint and steel? I have some personally, but I, I don't think we ever got any. Maybe that's why I didn't order. Oh, we did. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I knew it. Where they are is a mystery. Yeah, too. that's a great question. I remember that. Now. Well, and I it's found the willow chair, but I can't find the rods oh, that support it. I mean, there's just all kinds of little odds and ends. Tendon. Yeah. Well, we'll and that why is that important? It could be in the Wild West time? Days program boxes, and I have no idea what those are. Yeah. I have a question about public. Wow. Well, uh, what would you do? Like, we need to for the public, right? Yeah. And do we just let them clock the stations if they're here? Yep. Okay. We're going to post on the website, though, that I recommend that you don't come later in the day. <laughs> yeah. 400. Unless you want to share the museum yeah. with 400 yeah. So Does that have music? Or? No. Um, they actually would use that as string. Yeah, um, that's where I got. Yeah. Tying things. Uh -huh. yeah. Tying things. Okay. So you chew it. I know this sounds terrible, but you chew it, and that starts to break the fibers apart. Or something. Uh -huh. yeah. so like yuck it. Yuck. Yuck. Exactly. Yes, but it doesn't. That's yeah, quite a process. I would agree. Yeah, it's been a long process. Mm. So, wow, for the two of you, I'm guessing there would be more of a preference to be at the biodiversity wall and the table with the traps and stat and fur as opposed to the tools table. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As long as, long as I can Kids from Brandon and I, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. actually, I have Having a son. I know this, how that this works. This looks very new. I have something I've already from, done my, stitches from once. my parents. It was probably yeah. seven years old. But it looks seven years old. Uh, an old porcelain. We get so. some reproduction. <laughs> so so that's yes, cool. that's a modern reproduction. Yeah, that's it. It's worn well. Wow, it's really thick. To well, what you would buy now, though. It is, really, but it was. Cooked, this is a good. Cooked uh, over a fire. Mm -hmm. you know, it keeds out the Cumberland in general. I was going to say, they probably make them the same oh, way. They probably make them on the same. Yeah. The same. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Campfire. They probably yeah. found that old mold. Wow, it's always a good way for camping. And these all say, keep it up. Yeah, it's not as good. Last one ever. Cool. Awesome. Wonderful class. Well, yeah, so, so, I was going to say, back to the tools, those you know, yeah. mountain men would probably have made their own little um, hole in the wall kind of house shelter, shelter and, and stash their stuff in it and yeah. move around as they need it to. Yeah. But. There's some really good. Um, Resources on the experience of the wolvers, like up in Wyoming, and um, how they would hunker down in the winter and follow the trap lines. Um, there would be groups of them, they build a cabin together, like three or four of these guys. I can just imagine the odor. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, but they'd all have their own trap lines that they'd go and check. 
But they they take several days to go make the rounds, so they were camping out from what I could understand. They might feel like a lean to shelter overnight. Um, well, there's something maybe a little more permanent as much snow as they get. Mm -hmm. So they have some shelter. Yeah. But but that's so about the wolvers, and so that's a different time frame and a different environment. But the mountain men, gosh, they teach them how to do I think he hung out with the Indians. Yeah. A lot of them did. I think he did, because well, I think he and I think he had yeah. I mean that's it's, just a it's matter winter of survival. Too. And it's, it's winter and they're they're probably all you know, he's going out hunting. But I think he had yeah, I think he found pretty good like a uh, place that was warm and he was like I picture it being a lot like, um, you know, it's just so early, but I picture it being a lot like the prospectors. There's more photographs from the 1870s and 1880s of these tiny little log mm -hmm. cabins, shacks, really, that those guys would build in the 1870s and 1880s, and I think we can extrapolate that to what they would have been doing in the 1830s. Because um, he was roaming all around in the mountains. I think, like, even caves, like, where bears are, and, you know, more permanent shelters, like rock, you know, sides and field sides, yeah. and, you know, where. Because he, he was all over. Well, I do know they would get materials to help keep their cabins warmer, so um, if they could come across a newspaper. Highly unlikely, but burlap mm, yeah. and um, tar paper. Mm -hmm. They would just tack that up to the inside wall for yeah. insulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also tell people, you know, they're acclimated differently than we are. Well, being outside all the time. <laughs> yeah, but when you're cold and wet, I mean, <laughs> as long as they keep dry, which the you know bear grease, the skins, or whatever. Yeah. Right. Well. But, um, yeah, well, I heard felt that they made like a like an undercoat. Well, I think wool was really felt important. and then put it under one of those skin coats, coats or, or even a poncho -y kind of. And no, I don't know. Uh, I was up uh, at Granby this last year um, in the National Park Santa, kind of an open day, and they had a um, bison coat that people could try on. Oh, and wow. those things weigh about a hundred pounds. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I'm I, I don't think he rode around on his horse on that because it seems like the horse killed the, the horse. But they are so heavy. I mean when we so put the bison coat up here in the exhibit it took several people to rush to fill that up. It's amazing. So if he had something like that, uh, just a buffalo hide or something for in his cabin, he wouldn't, you know, mm -hmm. he would be pretty well taken care of from there. And they would, they would get overcoats of canvas, and then they would paint something on Probably it. water would be a, yeah, paint. Like tar, like, like, like the, like yeah, the, like Yeah, so that's what the old tarps it. were made yeah. out of. Or like the, the, from the tree, the sap? I don't know. I don't know that probably. No, I think it was a something painted. Something they bought. Yeah. Something they that would yeah keep it Is waterproof. It yeah, probably not. Well, but that does make they sense. They call it oil cloth. I think. Well, oil yeah. cloths was used in the, as a tablecloth. That's what we had. Well, I'd have to look that up because yeah, but they used it as a tarp. The cowboys. Did. That's what I was thinking. Cowboys were doing that. Or, or even a shelter. A shelter. You know. On some trees would keep the water and the snow off. Yeah. You know, just temporary. Keep the moisture out anyway. And I think they would carry like a little bottle of kerosene with them also. They have their flint steel, but they also use kerosene when they pinch to get fires going. Yeah, got it. <laughs> you call it kerosene. I know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> kerosene. Just in case they needed that for medicinal purposes. Yeah. Or from the inside out. <laughs> Oh, we have that too. Okay. Well, this is awesome. This is a wonderful collection. Excellent. Well, we're really happy to oh. have you guys. There were snowshoes on the wall. 
Yes. Okay. How old are those? I can't remember. Those are turn of the century. Okay. But I would guess that the style is Pretty similar to what these guys are doing. Yeah. Making and using themselves. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Awesome. Very nice. And I think, like you said, the wool. If they had something wool, that's another watery yeah. kind of thing. And we do the have some. Area. We do have some wool samples. They're just out in the box. I just don't think the flint and steel is in there, but I know we had some. And we had, I thought, a little tin for holding matches. Boy, this guy is holding down. Well, I think that a lot. Um, they must have had a, a base to keep things. Keep a lot of supplies. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't carry all this around. Yeah, and you know, no. they're not. They're kind of pre-mule. Prospectors would take a mule with them. They'd load up all their stuff on the back of their mule, and that's just not what these mountain men. No, because they were out breaking trail and exploring yeah, all over in the mountains. Out they kind of yeah. made a lot of the trails for people to follow. Mm -hmm. um, can, can we do flint and steel and let, let kids yeah, because they'll be. How much time do we want to try well, that? Uh, I, I have some chunks of um, quartz, and you can you know hit them together in the dark room. Mm -hmm. and you can spark. See, you can spark. Yeah, they, they, they will not burn down the museum. <laughs> I'll see if I can find out. Your scout. Your scout. Yeah. Your scout. Bring Because I have piles of things and I have piles of cords. So that one looks good. I like it. I was just over at Carnegie on Friday? Yes, Friday morning. There's no snow. Yes, but luckily the city had gone through and shoveled most of it. If the wild west tub would not be in the building, it would be shattered. So it might be worth a house. So we've got things stored. <laughs> in the wild wild box. Box. I know exactly what that box looks like. I just can't find it. Mm -hmm. You're doing better than I would be. I don't even know what the box looks like. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, so you're very good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. We're good. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. And then we'll touch base the morning of your shift and make a final decision on 